So nice to meet you, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, I spend a lot of time to to explain about the seed vault for different audiences, and uh, uh, young people are among our target uh, audiences because uh, our task is is very long term uh, oriented, and it's important that young people know know about it and. Uh, will support it in the future. So uh, just a few points about seeds. Uh, I think um, um, you, you all know that we mostly eat seeds. Uh, maybe you know that we mostly eat seeds. Um, they are very important as a food source. Seeds are very nutritious. They can be stored. They make plants uh, able to survive uh, unfavorable uh, conditions during winters, during dry seasons, and so on. Uh, seeds uh, made it possible to develop modern farming equipment, machinery, and so on. And uh, it's also containing uh, genetic information and uh, new combinations of... of uh, Plants um, uh, occur when a mother plant and the fa father plant cross, and we get the new combinations in the seeds. And uh, there are many different kinds of seeds. Uh, all these are different uh, seeds from different species, and seeds is a perfect storage for genetic information, which is the reason why we keep them in gene banks. I have one slide showing animals. Uh, this illustrates why we take care of genetic diversity. <clears throat> As you know, you don't find uh, dogs in the nature. You fi don't find wild animals like the dogs, but you find the genes. And uh, in principle, these three uh, animals here are, are uh, wolves, uh, you don't find the dogs in the nature, but you find the genes uh, that made it possible to breed these dog breeds. You find them in the wild wolf populations, which is quite amazing, I must say. And it's the same uh, with plants. <clears throat> you don't find uh, mace, wild mace in, in, in the nature, but you find the genes in the wild plants. <laughs> In this case, you find uh, the genes for maize in, in the wild plant Tripsacum, which is growing in, in, the, in the Central America. And it's the same for wild, uh, wild cabbage types. You don't find these vegetables in, in the wild. But uh, actually on the shores in your country, I think, around the Mediterranean, you can find these uh, wild brassica plants. Uh, and these wild plants contain the genes that made it possible to breed normal head cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower. All these genes are present in, in wild plants. And uh, here you have uh, the so-called global centers for the origin of crop species. Uh, these are the most uh, important regions of the world where you find the wild plants that made it possible to, to breed cultivated plants. And uh, these are also the areas of the world where uh, agriculture first uh, was developed. And uh, you can see in, in Mexico and in the, in, the mid, in, in the Central America, you find Maize and beans, you all probably know that potatoes comes from Peru and Southern America, tomatoes also from there. And then we have the, the area around the, the Mediterranean Sea where in the east uh, is an important area called the Fertile Crescent uh, where we believe that uh, agriculture first uh, was developed on the basis of uh, wild plants uh, found in nature, mainly wild, wild grasses with uh, large seeds. So this is the history of what we call domestication. 
uh, farmers in the first uh, years they found wild plants or actually before agriculture evolved they found uh, wild plants they harvested the seeds and uh, in this case they ate uh, wild barley seeds then they started to cultivate farmers uh, improved uh, the plants so they could cultivate them in their fields and farmers uh, genotypes farmers varieties are called land races and the modern breeding uh, produced modern cultivars so why do we conserve crop diversity and and the short question is that uh, the diversity of crop plants uh, is the raw material that plant breeders and scientists need to, to develop agriculture, produce new plant varieties, uh, to secure future food production. We ha have a change, change in climate on the planet, and we need new plant varieties to, to fight new growing conditions, to increase food production, to fight diseases and pests, and so on. So, um, because it is important to conserve these genetic resources, uh, gene banks all over the world conserve uh, seeds containing different varieties, different genetic combinations, and make these, uh, this uh, material available for, for uh, breeding and science. I'm working at the Nordic uh, Genetic Resource Center, which is a regional gene bank for the Nordic countries. And uh, we have seed samples uh, of interest for the Nordic agriculture, mainly. We have a collection of 35,000 samples uh, of a bit more than 500 different species. So uh, we are moving to Svalbard. You can see the map of Europe there. Uh, Svalbard is an, a group of islands uh, midway between uh, northern Norway and the North Pole. And you can see a more detailed map in, in the middle there. You have the city of Longyearbyen, which is the place where the seed vault is uh, located. Here are some pictures from Svalbard. It's a very exotic place. Uh, it's very cold there. Here are some uh, pictures from summertime. Uh, you can uh, you can meet the polar bears in the streets, not actually in the streets, but outside the streets, outside the village, and sometime <clears throat> sometime you uh, you can meet it also meet them also in, quite close to the to the. Um, uh, to the center of, of, of Longyearbyen. And this is a very dangerous animal. So if you move outside Longyearbyen, you have to, to protect yourself wearing a gun uh, or follow someone with a gun. And there are some nice flowers there during summertime. There are a special breed of reindeer in, in Longyearbyen. You can meet them uh, everywhere. And the grouse is there, the bird. Uh, is very is not very wild. They they uh, run uh, between your feet when when you are walking outside in the nature there. So it's a very different different place from from uh, the Europe, uh, other places in Europe. Uh, Longyearbyen Svalbard was established as a coal mining place. There are coal layers there and. Coal mining started about 100 years ago, uh, and it's still going on. Uh, su supplying the power plant in Svalbard with, uh, with electricity. And it has now been decided that uh, coal mining should uh, stop. And uh, the community in Longyearbyen uh, is working on uh, how to develop other uh, energy sources uh, replacing the coal. Um, another couple of pictures from Longyearbyen. You can climb the mountains around the city and it looks like this. Uh, there are some fishing boats uh, fishing around the islands and there is also a quite large 
satellite reading station where satellites passing uh, over the North Pole can be information can be downloaded and distributed to users all around the world. And Svalbard is also important for science and education. The picture below here is from from a village called Nyhellesund, which is a, a pure uh, science village where scientists from all over the world go and study nature, environment, climate change, uh, glaciers, and so on. And I also think Italy has scientists uh, there. The upper picture is from the university center in Longyearbyen, and students from all countries uh, in the world go there. Also, Italian students are often there and study nature, environment, and, and climate in, in the Arctic on this university. So that could be something you could consider when you have finished uh, the high school. And there are also a lot of tourists in Svalbard. Uh, many cruise ships uh, go there. You can uh, climb uh, down below the glaciers and, and experience uh, snow ice caves like the picture to the right. Uh, you can eat whale and seal on board the cruise ships uh, and the, the northernmost brewery in the world is also located in, in Svalbard. So you can taste beer at the northernmost Svalbard brewery. And there are a couple of Russian settlements in Svalbard. Uh, the two upper pictures are from Pyramiden, which is an abandoned coal mining um, uh, village. and uh, no one lives there, but tourists can go there. Uh, the picture from below is from Barentsburg, where where Russians still uh, mine okay. coal for Thank the you. industry. So then, uh, so, the history uh, of uh, conserving seeds in Svalbard started in 1984. Uh, the Nordic Gene Bank put a steel container into a coal mine there. There is permafrost in the coal mine, minus three, minus four degrees, which uh, secure that the uh, seeds stay frozen, which is important for conserving the, the viability of the seeds. So uh, copies of the Nordic seed collection uh, was placed in this steel container in 1984. And this gained a lot of uh, attention worldwide. Uh, several newspapers in, in many countries wrote about uh, the seeds of life that were banked in an Arctic coal mine, as you can see here from China Daily. This is a picture from inside this uh, steel container. We had the safety base collection in the container, and we also put in some seed samples for uh, for um, uh, testing the viability of the seeds over time. As I will just make this very brief. Uh, the solution for conserving duplicates of seeds in Svalbard gained a lot of international attention and uh, after some years of, uh, of uh, discussions, Nor Norway was asked to, to, uh, to um, investigate would it be possible for Norway to build a global seed storage in Svalbard, not only for Nordic seeds, but for, for seeds from all other countries as well. And Norway decided to build the seed vault uh, in June 2006. And the seed vault was opened in February 2008. So uh, the, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault have, has two objectives. One objective is to conserve security duplicates of unique seed samples conserved in gene banks. It, it's important, important to stress that the seed vault is not a gene bank. It's just a storage for conserving backup copies of seeds that are conserved in gene banks. 
And it's also contributing to public awareness about the importance of conservation and use of plant genetic resources. And that's why I'm talking to you today to, to convince you and, and tell you why it is important to, to conserve seeds and conserve genetic diversity of plants. This is a quote from the General Secretary of Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, he called the seed vault. This is a gift to humanity and a symbol of peace. And this is a quote we we use in our presentations. But why is Valbard? It, it, it's a cold place, of course. It uh, was inspired by the Nordic solution for backupping seeds in this in, in this coal mine, and it is uh, good infrastructure there. It's uh, an international airport. It uh, it is uh, municip. It is public services there. It's it's police. It's it's roads. You can hire cars. There are companies that can assist us and all the operations. And not at least, Norway had the resources to build it, and uh, the commitment and also countries and gene banks all over the world trust that Norway and our partners take good care of the seeds. So for because it's it's important to say that the seeds that are conserved in the seed vault they remain the property of the of the gene banks. Uh, seeds are never touched by us. The, the seed boxes are sealed and we uh, uh, bring them into the seed vault and the owner gene bank can get them back if they need them. Here a drawing of how it looks like. Uh, what you have seen from pictures from outside is, is just a concrete building at the end of this tunnel and inside deep inside the mountain uh, there are three seed chambers that are artificially cooled down to minus 18 which is the optimal temperature for conserving seeds and there are of course advanced monitoring and surveillance systems alarms locks solid doors and etc so this is very safe Here's some pictures from inside. It, it looks like an ordinary warehouse, but uh, when you think about what's in all these boxes and where they come from, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. So one of the three seed chambers has been filled up and we have started to fill up the second chamber and one third chamber is still available and, and not taken into use yet. Uh, I can skip. Uh, most of the formalities but just say that the seed vault is owned by the Norwegian government it's managed by, by my um, organization the Nordic Genetic Resource Center and we cooperate with this international uh, organization Crop Trust uh, which is uh, supporting gene banks all over the world for the conservation and use of genetic resources and seeds and also, uh, also they support the management of the seed vault. It's free of charge. Gene banks can send seeds to the seed vault uh, without any costs. Uh, they can get the seeds back if they need them. And uh, the seeds are owned by the gene banks. I just skip this. Uh, it's too complicated uh, this time. Here are some statistics. Uh, over the years since 2008, more than 1.3 million samples have been deposited. Uh, one gene bank uh, have requested seeds to be returned. I will come back to that. Uh, today, there are 1.2 million samples in the seed vault, representing uh, more than 6,000 different the species 98 uh, depositor gene banks have sent seeds and uh, the seeds are coming from more than 200 different countries all around the world here is uh, a curve showing how 
the content of the seed vault has increased during the years. So now it's about 1.2 million samples, as I said. And here are the most important crops. There are uh, more than 200,000 different samples of wheat and uh, 175 samples of rice and then more than 100,000 samples of barley. And then you see the other important crops, uh, seed uh, multi uh, multiplied crops, sorghum, bean, soybean, maize, chickpeas and uh, oats and uh, rye and peas and peanuts and, and so on. Uh, in the other end of this uh, graph, you would see that some species have only one or two uh, samples of seeds inside the seed vault. As I said, only one uh, gene bank has requested seeds to be returned, and this was the International Center for Agricultural Research in Dry Areas. Formerly, they had headquarters and gene bank in Aleppo in Syria. Due to the war, the seeds there were un inaccessible, and they decided to establish new gene banks in Morocco and Lebanon. Uh, we sent all the 116,000 seed samples back to ICARDA units in these countries, and they established uh, new gene banks there. And already today, just a few years after we returned the seeds, they have sent uh, more than 117,000 seed samples back to the seed vault. Which is a success story for the seed vault, illustrating the need for a seed vault like this. And uh, despite the war in Syria, it uh, is a sad story, sad event. Uh, it shows the, the need for a seed vault like this. Anyone can enter the, um, the computer and see what's the content of, of the seed vault at any time. You get statistics uh, of this, and you can see just today it's 98 depositors, 6,042 species, and 1.2 million samples. You can search more details, and this is a search showing uh, showing uh, seed samples that have been uh, deposited from an Italian gene bank. It's actually today only two seed samples from the University of Lombardy, Lombardy Seed Bank. And uh, those two samples of maize are, are listed uh, in, 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 the, in the bottom of this picture. But now I am uh, revealing one, one uh, secret for you. Uh, you are the first to hear that uh, the Italian National Gene Bank, Institute of Biosciences and Bioresources at the National Research Council in Italy will send seeds in June. And they will send one box with 192 accessions of, uh, of uh, wheat, different wheat species. Triticum is the scientific name of wheat. So, so you should not tell this to anyone, but I would guess that uh, in June, you will read about this uh, event in, in Italian newspapers. So just uh, to end with some, uh, some pictures showing how we work. And gene banks pack seeds like this in watertight envelopes. Seeds need to be very well dried and then packed like this. Uh, they pack them in boxes like this and send the boxes to Svalbard. We scan all the seed boxes at the security uh, devices at the airport. And here you can see on the screen uh, two seed boxes uh, that do not have any other items inside, just seed uh, packets. Uh, we bring the seeds to the seed vault. Sometimes the weather can be like this. This is taken now in February and we have to, to walk in deep snow and carry all boxes uh, inside uh, like this. 
Uh, inside, we um, had to sort them. We put on labels showing uh, the identity of the gene bank, the number of boxes, and, uh, and the position in the shelves. And we bring all the boxes inside and put them on, on the shelves. And I think that's it. Um, these are pictures from different uh, seed boxes, reminding us that seeds are coming from different countries and that uh, many different people, scientists, gene bank uh, staff, put a lot of efforts in producing these seeds and send them to Svalbard. So, I think that's it. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, and now we try to understand if there are uh, some questions. Uh, Hello, my, Hello. Name, my name is Ricardo, and my question is, how much time does it take to create one of these uh, uh, seam bank? Yeah, I think the construction work started in 2007, and it was finalized and the seed vault opened in February 2008. Uh, this was a big a bit too quick because the quality of certain parts of the seed vault was not good enough so so there has been uh, some improvement of the construction uh, in 2018 and 2019 so so now the uh, the construction is very solid very very uh, prepared for uh, for a long future so in total i think uh, all the work took about uh, two and a half years. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Andrea, and uh, my question is the is the same. Um, um, is is um, um, in the in the in, in the in the in the place uh, in the place at the Svalbard um, they are the the seeds of the culture plants or or, or the seeds of the or plants in the world a uh, good question uh, the seed vault is and gene banks for crop plants they conserve seeds of crops uh, cultivated plants uh, but we also consider wild plants containing genes uh, of uh, crop plants to to be included so we, we call them crop wild relatives so if you remember my my picture from brassica on, on the mediterranean shores this is a wild plant, but it is the kind of ancestor of crop plants. So this is also in, in included in gene banks and in the seed vault, but purely wild plants, rare species that do not uh, have any interest as crops, they are not included. Other programs are taking care of those. Uh, I heard that uh, you had some problem with uh, uploading some years ago, maybe in 2017, um, with uh, melting uh, ice uh, for the climate change. So have you re uh, solved that problem? Uh, and Yes, uh, the, the problem was that the, the seed vault tunnel was not uh, completely watertight in 2018 and 19 uh, we built a new watertight uh, tunnel so the problem is solved and it was not uh, melting ice and permafrost that caused the problem it was an extremely heavy rainfall in in Svalbard just in the autumn 2016 
And uh, when the tunnel was not watertight, some of this uh, rain uh, water came into the tunnel. But the problem has been solved, yes. Uh, just to comment on, on the previous question, um, it is correct that many plants uh, risk to be extinct and uh, uh, some rare plants can be found in gene banks and in the seed vault if they are considered to be related to crops. But uh, there are other programs taking care of rare and threatened plants. For instance, we have the the Millennium Seed Project at Kew Gardens in uh, in UK. <coughs> they conserve all seeds of all threatened plants around the world. So, so if some plants uh, is going extinct, seeds can hopefully be retrieved from that collection. Hey, Andres Alba, um, I would ask if there is a, uh, if you have a connection with the germoplast banks of the different states, nations, um, because I thought you have, but from what you say, or maybe what I understood, there is, there is no connection between, between the Svalbard Center and the germoplast bank of different nations. Yes, um, that should be. <laughs> if I understand your question correctly, that's a quite uh, major misunderstanding because all these 98 <coughs> institutes that have sent seeds to the seed vault, they are national gene banks all over the world. So they we cooperate with them. They keep the primary collections and for safety purposes, they send duplicates to the seed vault. <coughs> And when when the National Gene Bank of Italy will uh, send the first seeds in June, this will be gene bank number ninety nine. Another question: um, uh, You um, maintain this all the seeds, but how many uh, years? Uh, the seeds um, maintain their germinality power. So, uh, how many after how, how many years you have to replace to renewal the seeds? Uh, that depends on several things: on the species, uh, on the quality of the seeds. Uh, on the maturing, was it a wet year? Was it a dry year? Was the quality of the seeds good? Were the seeds dried properly and packed watertight properly? So that's, um, I would say that seeds of some species of good quality, uh, packed well, they can stay alive for several hundred years. Some of them probably more than 1000 years. Okay, we want to thank you so much uh, to, to be with you today and uh, I hope uh, we had understand more about biodiversity and seed conservation yeah. and your job. Uh, we, are, we were uh, really honored to, to host you and I want to thank you from the uh, side of all the students. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, and maybe some of you will uh, with uh, I will meet you in Svalbard at the university there. Uh, would be would be really nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye. Bye.